Well, hello, everybody. It is wonderful to be with you here today. I'd like to start with a heartfelt thanks coming from me, but on behalf of the entire cannabis community, to Leafly and to South by Southwest for creating the cannabis track, for welcoming us to Austin and helping us cross this next new important milestone on the journey of cannabis from the counterculture into the mainstream. So thank you. <laughs> so this thing may get a little bit fact heavy at times. Uh, so bear with me as we go through some of the facts because there will be a greater point to be made. It'll be worth sticking through it. Around 50 years ago, a strange and wondrous thing happened. Millions of young people, mostly from middle-class families, dropped out of mainstream society. They left comfortable homes and careers, good jobs, secure futures that were in front of them. In some cases, said goodbye to their parents, in many cases, didn't say anything at all. And they gathered together in marginalized neighborhoods in places like Greenwich Village and, and Haight-Ashbury, living communally in voluntary poverty, subsisting on whatever they could scrounge together. They, I'll say we because I was born at the tail end of that generation, was the first generation born after one of the most awful wars in human history, and the first generation to live with the ever-present threat of nuclear annihilation. We grew up in the shadow of the Holocaust and the Cold War, surrounded by suffocating post-war cultural conformity, deeply entrenched racism, rigid and oppressive sex roles, and the earliest revelations that our air and our food and our water had been poisoned by industrial chemicals. We didn't have to look far to see that the way of life that we were set to inherit, the system, was broken, was out of balance, non-functional, incapable of protecting life or justice for living creatures. So we knew, we knew that it needed to be changed, but we didn't know what to change it to. We didn't really have a clue. We knew that we needed to learn, but we didn't know what it was that we needed to learn. And so we explored, we experimented, we tried just about everything in every realm of life that the system had told us to avoid, from sex and politics to art and spirituality and technology and food and healthcare, searching for our way uh, to a better life. And this is how we found cannabis, sorting out our options, looking for a new way, going on voyages of discovery with no maps to guide us. We were quirky and we were controversial and we were colorful and so we were called lots of different names. And the one that stuck was the hippies, though we ourselves preferred not to be pigeonholed. Over time, living together communally, singing, dancing, sharing space, sharing ideas, sharing lovers and art, consuming cannabis and other visionary substances, we hippies began to define the new values that we wanted to live by. We valued creativity over conformity, individual freedom over authority. We valued kindness over cruelty and tolerance over prejudice and peace over war and above all else, we valued love over hate. And over the course of some more time and a lot more experiences, many of us, many of us came to credit cannabis and the other visionary substances for helping us learn these values and live by these values. And we thought that if it could do it for us, it could maybe do it for other people too. And we might eventually get to this world that we are dreaming of. So some of us, some of us decided to make the spreading of this plant and the knowledge that this plant teaches our sacred mission. We didn't know then about the science or history of cannabis, 
We didn't know about the medical benefits of cannabis. We didn't even begin to imagine things like job creation or investment opportunities or the explosion of cannabis companies on the Canadian public stock exchanges. All that we knew was that cannabis helped us be more like the people we really wanted to be. And we had sufficient faith in the human heart to believe that if it could do that for other people too, that one day we would all be able to live in this more peaceful, more just, and more sustainable world that we were dreaming of. Well, today, today we are all fortunate to be living through a time I call the cannabis renaissance. Our understanding of cannabis is much more sophisticated. So the original, the original renaissance referred to a period of time that came at the end of the Dark Ages in European history, when the lost knowledge of the ancient Greek and Roman and Egyptian civilizations was rediscovered and married up with more modern materials and production techniques. And this produced a parade of new ideas, new medicines, new inventions, new discoveries, new art, new ways of thinking and being in a very short period of time. Well, we're seeing the same thing with cannabis today. This kind and generous plant, used successfully by almost every culture on the planet for millennia, but brutally repressed in recent years, is finally coming out of the shadows and back into the light. And the lies, the lies that sustained the long, dark years of prohibition are being swept aside by a rising tide of reason. Modern laboratory analysis has given us the ability to finally see the elegant and powerful chemistry of the cannabis plant and all of the uses for cannabis cited in the world's most ancient medical texts are being validated by modern science. And the ignorance, the ignorance that's been produced by decades of prohibitionist propaganda, of biased, bogus, cooked up, government-funded pseudoscience is being swept away. And just as with the original Renaissance, the cannabis Renaissance is, un, is, is producing a, a parade, a cascade of new inventions, new medicines, new discoveries, new ways of thinking and new ways of being. And just as with the original Renaissance, the cannabis Renaissance holds the promise, holds the potential of unleashing a torrent of positive social change and ushering in a, a whole new world. So human beings have been using cannabis as a medicine since before the beginning of recorded medical practice. The world's first medical textbook, the Pen Sao Cheng, which recorded Chinese oral traditions dating from almost 3,000 years BCE, recommended cannabis for a wide range of ailments, including what it called rheumatism. Well, today, right now, if you wanted to, you could Google and do a quick search and find dozens of very valid, solid scientific studies demonstrating the efficacy of cannabis for a wide range of inflammation-related disorders, including arthritis and peritonitis and neuropathic pain and intestinal inflammation, many, many others. In fact, what we've learned is that cannabis may be the most potent anti-inflammatory medicine ever discovered. We see the, the, the same kind of pattern, right? Modern science validating ancient tradition with cancer. Human beings have known for many, many, many centuries about the tumor-fighting properties of cannabis. It was recommended for this purpose in the second century by an Egyptian medical text, the Al-Fayyam. A thousand years later, the famous physician, Persian physician, Ibn Sena, was still recommending cannabis to fight tumors. And 700 or 800 years after that, so was a large chunk of the English medical establishment. Well, what doctor, and today, today, the exact and precise mechanisms by which, can, by which cannabis fights cancer have been 
revealed have been discovered by a team of scientists working all around the world under the leadership of a guy named Dr. Manuel Guzman. Guzman is the professor of microbiology at the University of Madrid. He is also a member of the Royal Academy of Pharmacy. His credentials, his scientific reputation, are absolutely impeccable. And in a little while, I'll tell you more about what he and his teams discovered, because it's super exciting. Again, the same pattern. Modern science validates ancient tradition with epilepsy. We have known for many, many, many centuries about the seizure-frighting properties of cannabis. Another famous Persian physician, al Mayusi, recommended it for this purpose around the year 1000. 700 years after that, the man who brought cannabis to Western medicine, Dr. William O'Shaughnessy, was still recommending cannabis for seizures. And today, today you can go into the databases of the National Institute of Health and again find dozens of studies which reveal the exact and precise mechanisms by which cannabis prevents and alleviates epileptic seizures. And the FDA, the FDA just approved the first cannabis-derived pharmaceutical, Epidiolex, specifically for the treatment of epileptic seizures. So I could walk you through dozens of more examples showing you how modern science has validated these ancient teachings about cannabis. But that, that's research that you can all do on your own, and I encourage you to do it, because I'm going to move on to some other really exciting ideas and concepts about cannabis. One of the most important discoveries in this surge of science was the discovery that our bodies, human bodies, internally, endogenously, produce many of the same chemical compounds or virtually identical compounds as are produced in the cannabis plant. These compounds are known as cannabinoids, and the neurotransmitter system that makes and manages cannabinoids, the endocannabinoid system, is believed to be the largest neurotransmitter system in the human body. It's present in our brains, in all of our organs, in our skin, in our connective tissue, in our immune system, our circulatory system. It is present just about everywhere in the human body. And no matter where it is, its purpose remains the same. To restore, to maintain, to preserve homeostasis. Now, homeostasis is a relatively new concept, but I don't think that you can really understand cannabis or the role that cannabis plays in our world without it. The term was first coined by an American physician, Dr. Walter Cannon, in the 1930s. Cannon defined homeostasis as the tendency of living organisms to sustain themselves at a particular state to maintain the conditions necessary to their survival. The classic example of homeostasis is regulation of body temperature. Flushing, for example, is a homeostatic response to an overly hot environment. Small blood vessels expand to carry heated blood closer to the surface where it can be cooled. Shivering is a homeostatic response to an overly cold environment. Involuntary movements burn body tissue, which in turn produces heat. So both shivering and flushing are examples of biological homeostasis. But since Cannon, other thinkers have applied his concept more broadly to social, environmental, and even cybernetic systems. In fact, homeostasis is useful in understanding any highly complex open system. In order to survive, these kinds of systems must react dynamically to disturbances in their external environment. And they do this with a series of modifications that are equal in size, but opposite in direction to the original disturbance, with the aim of restoring balance. In order to endure, these kinds of systems must adapt and they must evolve. One of my favorite examples of the homeostatic effects of cannabis comes from an Israeli nursing home study. 
All of the patients in this study reported an immediate improvement in mood and a reduction in nightmares. But the really interesting results came around body weight. Patients who were above their ideal body mass index dropped weight and came closer to it. And patients who were under their ideal body mass index gained weight and came closer to it. A beautiful example of how cannabis restores the body's natural place of balance. The way that cannabis fights cancer is another elegant example of its homeostatic properties. The essence of the disease, the essence of cancer, is that our normal programmed process of cellular death, which is known as apoptosis, is interrupted. And the cellular material aggregates into masses that we call tumors. The tumors then appropriate blood vessels intended for other purposes to feed themselves, a process known as angiogenesis. Well, what cannabis does, and what Dr. Guzman and his team discovered, is that when you introduce cannabinoids into these cancer cells, the process of angiogenesis is slowed and then stopped while the process of apoptosis is simultaneously restarted. So the cancer cells are essentially blown up from within at the same time that they are starved from without. They wither, they die, and the body's place of natural balance is again restored without damage to surrounding tissue, without horrifying side effects. The ubiquity of the endocannabinoid system, how widespread it is in the human body, and this incredibly powerful role that it plays in restoring and maintaining our balance is the underlying explanation for why cannabis is so effective for such a seemingly wide range of unrelated medical conditions like the two examples that we just looked at here. It's also interesting that the endocannabinoid system is ubiquitous in nature. Every single animal on the planet has one, with the exception of insects. So they can all enjoy, <laughs> they can all enjoy the benefits of cannabis too. Okay, so another thing that we've learned about cannabis is that its biochemistry is far more complex than previously imagined, and it goes way beyond THC and CBD. Today, scientists believe there's something like 140 different cannabinoids. And the plant is also packed with another set of powerfully therapeutically active compounds known as terpenes. Terpenes are the substances that give everything on the planet from flowers to turpentine a sense of aroma, a smell. And today, Leading researchers, people like Raphael Meshulam, the man who discovered THC, and Lumir Hanush, one of the people that discovered the endocannabinoid system, are exploring the possibility that with the right combinations of cannabinoids and terpenes, cannabis medicines may be able to reach and treat every known human medical condition. Every known human medical condition. If that proves to be true, then the rediscovery of the therapeutic properties of cannabis will certainly rank as the most important medical discovery since the discovery of germ theory and will probably one day be recognized as the most important medical breakthrough of all time. At the very least, at the very least, we know that every anatomy textbook on the planet is going to have to be rewritten because they missed the largest neurotransmitter system in the human body. The real science of cannabis is also being applied to scaly old prohibitionist myths like the gateway theory. Instead of leading inexorably to heroin use, what scientists have discovered is that cannabis helps opioid patients reduce and in some cases eliminate their use of opioids. Cannabis ameliorates withdrawal symptoms, reduces relapses and prevents overdoses. It may, in fact, be the most potent tool that we have in the fight against the opioid epidemic. That's why states like Illinois have passed legislation allowing anybody, anybody with an opioid prescription to access the state's medical cannabis dispensaries. 
Another great debunking of prohibitionist mythology was a recent, recent meta-study published by the American Medical Association. This meta-study looked at dozens of previous older studies that had supposedly found permanent cognitive damage resulting from teenage cannabis use. They took a close look at the science used in those studies and found that in just a few cases, it was highly, highly dubious, but in the vast majority of cases, it was completely invalid. And around the same time, around the same time, other newer studies came out showing the effectiveness of cannabis for traumatic brain injury. This all led CNN chief medical correspondent Sanjay Gupta to comment, for the past 40 years, we've been told that cannabis will turn your brain into a fried egg. And now we have evidence that the opposite is true. Cannabis can heal your brain when nothing else can. And then commenting on the impact, the impact of these decades of piled up prohibitionist propaganda, Dr. Gupta said, for 70 years, for 70 years, we have been terribly and systematically misled in the United States. And I would add to Dr. Gupta's words that the voices of that misinformation were amongst the most respected, trusted, authoritative voices in American society. The United States Congress, the Department of Justice, the National Institute of Health, the president, and even the first lady. And the voice, the power, the reach of these voices was so strong, it was so long, that the majority of people who had not had any personal experience with cannabis, who had no access to the real science or the real history of the plant, just believed what they were told. But today, today those myths are crumbling. They're crumbling down just like most monuments to ignorance eventually, usually, hopefully, do crumble. Decades of work by a small army of passionately dedicated activists and scientists has done an end run around the prohibitionist propaganda machine and forced the truth about cannabis into the public eye. This is why Canada just became the first G7 nation to legalize cannabis completely at the federal level. It is the reason that the World Health Organization has called for its global rescheduling. It is the reason that countries, even countries with deep, deep cultural stigma towards cannabis like South Korea have embraced its medical use. It's the reason that the Surgeon General of the United States, a Trump appointee, recently endorsed the call for rescheduling, and it is the reason that almost every single Democratic candidate for president has endorsed national federal legalization of cannabis. Another thing, another thing that's changed is that we finally have the ability to do real evidence-based analysis of the impact of ending prohibition. For a long time, if you wanted to understand what legalization looked like, you had to believe the promises of activists like me or the cops. But today, we no longer need to speculate about what happens when we legalize cannabis. We have seen it firsthand in multiple US states over the course of several years. And the results, the results are clear and consistent. Not only has the sky not fallen, it has, in fact, become a lot more blue. <laughs> Criminal organizations have lost massive market share and corresponding power. Cross-border smuggling has been reduced. Tens of thousands of well-paying new jobs have been created and billions of dollars of tax revenue has been generated. Cops no longer need to spend money chasing a flower, so crime is going down. 10% drop in violent crime in Denver, Colorado following legalization. A 10 to 30% drop in rapes and thefts in the state of Washington following legalization. In every reform state, 
a drop in traffic fatalities. And couples, couples who consume cannabis, report a 40% lower rate of domestic violence than cannabis than couples who do not share cannabis. So don't take my word for it. All of these facts are easily verifiable in the databases of the states that I just mentioned. And so are the public health benefits of cannabis. Cannabis reform states, alcohol consumption and sales are down, and so is binge drinking. The state of California estimated this drop at 25% amongst young men, with a corresponding 10% drop in suicide amongst the same demographic. Pharma sales down in cannabis reform states. Medicaid reimbursements down in cannabis reform states. Doctors in cannabis reform states write 1,800 fewer opioid prescriptions per year than doctors in non-reform states. And the first 20 medical cannabis states, the first 20 medical cannabis states saw a 25% rate in the, in the rate, saw a 25% reduction in the rate of opioid overdoses. Slide. <clears throat> Study after study, and statistic after statistic, confirm these economic, public safety, and health benefits of cannabis. And more and more are coming all the time, right? For years and years, veterans have reported that cannabis eases their PTSD, helps them readjust to peacetime, prevents suicide. And now, after all of these years of desperate pleading, the Department of Justice finally recently approved human clinical trials designed to confirm those anecdotal reports. And in my dispensaries, Harborside dispensaries in California, we conducted an in-house study of our clients compared to the average Californian and found that the average Harborside client is more likely to have a college degree or a skilled trade, more likely to be married, and more likely to own their own home clearly benefits for the individuals involved, but also most of us would agree, I think, that these are benefits, increased home ownership, higher education, more stable family life that flows through to the entire society. So it's evident now that the intuitive sense of the hippies is being validated by evidence-based analysis and, and real science, it's true. When you change the laws, when you make cannabis more accessible to people, the world becomes a better place. Not just for cannabis consumers, but also for non-consumers alike. The ingestion of harmful substances is ameliorated. Violent tendencies are tamed. Suicides and overdoses are prevented. So, this ability of cannabis to, to generate all of these, these positive effects is an example of another form of homeostasis, social homeostasis. Like human bodies, human societies must maintain some degree of internal stability. And they do this by balancing competing economic, cultural, and political factors. The uh, law of supply and demand is one example of social homeostasis. The interaction of those two factors keeps most prices reasonably stable most of the time. Elections, elections can be seen as another form of social homeostasis. They provide stability of governance amidst a changing political environment. Well, when social homeostasis fails, its absence becomes really evident. This is when we see riots, deportations, walls, wars, genocide, the kind of thing that we're seeing way, way too much of in the world today. But there is some hope. There is some hope on the horizon. Because the cannabis renaissance, the cannabis renaissance doesn't stop with our bodies and it doesn't stop with our societies. It goes on to human industry. 
We humans have been making things out of cannabis probably for as long as we've been consuming it, or maybe longer. One of the very earliest artifacts of human civilization is a piece of woven hemp textile found by archaeologists in Mesopotamia dating from 8,000 BCE. Hemp also gave us the world's first paper. That happened in 150 BCE. By the time of the Middle Ages, in Europe, 80% of all clothing was being made out of cannabis hemp. During the age of the maritime empires, it was considered a vital strategic raw material because hemp produced the ropes and the sails that powered the ships that built the empires. So when the Europeans came to the New World, they brought cannabis with them. One of the very first acts of the First Virginia Assembly in 1619 was a requirement, a mandate, that every farmer in the state grow cannabis because the founders of Virginia understood that cannabis, that hemp, was a vital raw material for the building of their new state. George Washington grew cannabis on his plantation. The covers of the Conestoga wagons that carried pioneers west were made of hemp, and so was the homespun clothing they wore along the way. And when they got to the west coast and they could buy a nice, crisp, new pair of Levi's, those were made of hemp, too. So these millennia, millennia of robust hemp manufacturing continued into the later part of the Industrial Revolution when a combination of factors pushed it into decline. Eli Whitney's cotton gin made the processing of cotton a lot less expensive than the processing of hemp. Vast new petroleum reserves were discovered and exploited. Synthetic textiles and fabrics and fibers were invented along with pesticides and fertilizers and a whole class of chemicals that made it cheaper and easier to turn trees into paper. Alternatives to cannabis hemp started appearing on the marketplace and in the beginning, at first glance, they seemed less expensive than hemp. So they started claiming market share and they kept on claiming market share. But that's not what killed the hemp industry in the United States. It took an act of the government to do that because our farmers, our farmers were growing cannabis hemp right up until federal prohibition in 1937. We didn't know any of this history in the early days of the cannabis reform movement. Any of it. It only came to light when one of our greatest heroes, Jack Herrer, published his hugely influential book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, and that happened in the 1980s. Jack, Jack was the first person to suggest that this ancient plant could be married up with our more modern production techniques and our more modern materials. And that if we did that, that it had the potential of powering a majority of our factories and a majority of our workshops. I know that's a pretty audacious claim, but let me back it up for you. Hemp is an extraordinary raw material. With today's technologies, 25,000 or more different products can be made out of it, including just about anything that's made out of trees or petroleum or cotton. These include massive product categories like food and fuel and fiber and paper and plastics and construction materials. Hemp can be grown successfully organically and when done at scale will probably outcompete any other raw material for cost and quality. One acre of trees, one acre of hemp in one season will produce multiples more biomass than an acre of trees will over the course of several years. And unlike paper from trees, which requires toxic chemicals to be turned into paper, hemp paper can be made with a simple process of heat and pressure. Fiberboard made from hemp is lighter than fiberboard made from trees and can be just as strong. Hempcrete, concrete made from the inner stalks of the hemp plant, is lighter than regular concrete. 
It is more mold resistant than regular concrete, more fire resistant, has better insulative properties, and is carbon neutral. Hemp could probably replace almost all cotton production. Have you ever been to a cotton farm? In the United States, most of them are surrounded by high chain link fences right, with skull and crossbone warnings on them. That's because more pesticides are poured onto the cotton crop than any other crop in the United States. You go to these places and they feel more like toxic dump zones than they do farms. And hemp, hemp is a great alternative to cotton. It's the longest and strongest fiber on the planet. Well, cotton is among the shortest and weakest. Hemp is a hardy plant, naturally resistant to pests, but cotton, cotton is, is weak and feeble. It's highly vulnerable to a wide range of pests and diseases. And the, the, the products that are made from hemp, the textiles that are made from hemp, the clothing that is made from hemp, incredibly durable, incredibly durable. Last literally for decades upon decades. You can go into Europe and you can find old wills, right, where people are willing 70 and 80 year old hemp linens uh, to their descendants. That's why we say that hemp doesn't wear out, it wears in. And the nutritional potential of cannabis is staggering. Right? Hemp seeds contain a better balance of essential fatty acids than any other food source, including flax, soil, including fish oil. And those same seeds can be ground up into a flour that can be used to make bread or pasta or pizza, or they can be squeezed into a milk, and they're all delicious. Forward, and, and hemp also right, could potentially be a food source for animals, could move us away from crops like soybeans that are dependent on genetic modification or chemical inputs. We've already seen chefs, forward-looking companies invent things like hemp tempeh and hemp tofu and hemp ice cream. And moving into the future, future generations are going to develop as yet unimagined kinds of hemp food, a new, inexpensive, delicious, organic food source for the future. Then there's petroleum, good old petroleum. Hemp like corn, can be distilled into ethanol and its seeds pressed into a beautiful emerald green oil. That oil by itself can be used as an alternative fuel for almost any kind of diesel engine, from cars and trains to electrical power plants. And hemp increasingly is being used as a replacement feedstock for the products that are made out of petroleum, most notably plastics. But hemp plastics, unlike petroleum plastics, are mostly recyclable and mostly biodegradable. And once again, none of this is new. A hundred years ago, Henry Ford built an experimental plastic car using hemp and other farm crops. It was powered by ethanol. It was reportedly 10 times stronger than a car made out of steel and much, much lighter. And there is no reason, there is no reason we can't make many more of those automobiles today. The urgency certainly couldn't be any greater. Our global addiction to petroleum is already melting glaciers, unleashing terrible storms and floods, and destroying natural and human habitats. Time is short, and it's getting shorter day by day. So one of the most exciting parts of the cannabis renaissance is the potential that cannabis has to generate another, yet another kind of homeostasis, environmental homeostasis, to provide a new basis for our industrial economy, to move us away from crops that depend on chemical inputs and genetic modification, to create a cleaner and greener source of energy to help us build our homes and our workplaces and all of those boxes from Amazon without cutting down the last tree on Earth, without turning Earth into a cinder. 
Imagine a truck built of plastic, powered by ethanol or electricity from a hemp power plant. Imagine all of the boxes in that truck and all of the plastic wrapping those boxes and many of the products that are in those boxes and the uniform of the driver and her shoes and her socks, all made of hemp. Or imagine a cafe where the menus are printed on hemp paper, where the tablecloths and napkins are made of hemp textiles, where the pizza and the pasta and the bread and the salad dressing is made out of hemp seeds. Or imagine a home, a home built of hempcrete, full of furniture built out of hemp fiberboard and carpeted with natural hemp instead of toxic extruded petroleum. You know, the big news about hemp is that now with the passage of the 2018 Farm Bill, it is legal, it is legal to cultivate in every single state in the nation. As long as it's 0.3% THC or less, it's legal. So the raw material, the raw materials in our hands now are almost in our hands, awaiting our imaginations, our hearts, our determination to craft it into a new kind of world. We already have hard science on the homeostatic benefits of cannabis in our bodies and in our societies. I believe that with enough ingenuity and imagination, enough energy, enough heart, enough determination, that we may be able to affect a homeostatic rebalancing of the natural environment we all depend on for life. So, let me give you a little peek into the kind of thing I'm thinking of, right? One of the most disturbing pieces of news that I've received in recent years is the widespread and growing dis disappearance of bee populations. We lost about 30% of managed hives in the United States last year. That was an increase of 10% over the year before. And losing these bees is about a lot more than the price of honey. Millions and millions of people around the world depend on crops that are pollinated by bees. They are a critical part of our highly complex interrelated ecosystem and we cannot afford to continue losing them at current rates. This is why one of the most positive, inspiring pieces of news, news I've heard now recently is the story of a young entomologist named Colton O'Brien. Colton went to the hemp fields of northern Colorado and conducted bee population surveys. And he found a surprising abundance of bees, both individual bees and genera, or different types of bees. When he gave his report to a conference, Colton said, when you go in the fields, you hear buzzing everywhere. The bees were feeding on the hemp late in the season. After most other crops had gone out of bloom, there was a dearth of nutritional resources. The bees were feeding on the hemp. They were feeding on the hemp despite the fact that the hemp had no nectar to offer them, only pollen. But it appeared, it appeared that that pollen was enough to save the bees from starvation late in the season and slow down, mitigate the rate of bee loss. Now one study, and that's all we have right now, not nearly enough to draw firm conclusions from. But we have other more solid evidence of the potential of cannabis to affect an environmental homeostasis. It's been found to be a powerful phytoremediator of contaminated soil, first used for this purpose in the nuclear disaster zone at Chernobyl, and since then has been used successfully in a bunch of places, including China, where it removed cadmium from the soil, and Italy, where it's removing a toxic blend of lead and nickel. The story in Italy is worth taking a closer look at. It's instructive about the kind of thing that could happen all around the world. For centuries, the town of Toronto was renowned, world renowned, for its fine traditional cheese. Tourists came from all over to taste it. That changed when a new steel mill opened in town and within several years, all of the pasture land had been contaminated. The animals that gave the milk that made the cheese were poisoned and residents were left with elevated levels of cancer and kidney disease. 
All of the animals were culled, and the livelihoods of hundreds of farmers shattered. The farmers recovered by planting hemp, and today that pasture land is getting cleaner and cleaner year by year. At last report, it was still not yet clean enough to welcome back the animals, but in the meantime, the hemp that was being harvested was being safely processed into ethanol and providing the farmers with a source of income. So how cool is this? How cool is this? Some force, some force has awakened us human beings and we're becoming more and more enamored with the cannabis plant. And as we become more enamored, we plant more and more of it. And as more and more cannabis is grown, we are beginning, we are beginning to remove some of the poison that we've put into the planet and welcome back some of the life that we've chased away. This is the kind of homeostatic rebalancing that I think a shift to a hemp economy could potentially bring. And there's a lot more to come. The potential is huge. It's just awaiting our hearts and hands to work it. The part of the cannabis renaissance that gives me the most hope is also the part that's most difficult to objectively measure or even describe. I've begun calling it homeostasis of the spirit and the soul. I'm thinking about the power of cannabis to extend patience, to encourage tolerance, to heighten appreciation of nature, to wake up a sense of wonder and play, to enhance the flavor of a meal, or the sound of music, or the touch of a lover's skin. The way cannabis can help a lyricist find just the right word, or a painter find just the right color, or a musician find just the right tone. The way a little cannabis can turn an argument into a discussion, or a walk through the forest into a spiritual experience. The way cannabis can wake up our own inner voices, alert us to our transgressions, and inspire us to heal them. The way a little bit of cannabis can bring a smile and sometimes even a laugh in moments where humor might otherwise seem impossible. So what would a world look like where cannabis was being consumed as widely as pharma and alcohol is being consumed in our world today, we know, we know that cannabis helps couples resolve their disputes more peacefully and helps veterans readjust to peacetime. Could it help larger groups of people grow more tolerant of one another and find ways to resolve their differences without violence? Larger groups like races and religions and nations we know cannabis reduces violent crime. Could we see the same kind of effect on larger, more mass forms of violence like warfare and genocide? We know that the activists who desegregated the American South were cannabis consumers, and we know that millions of cannabis consuming fans have made the anti-racist songs of artists like Bob Marley and Snoop Dogg massive international hits. Could more widespread consumption of cannabis also inspire other efforts to reduce racism and maybe someday end it? We know that cannabis is historically associated with manifestations of joy, seeing, creating, appreciating art and music, dancing and singing and feasting experiencing and feeling the wonders of nature, praising and appreciating romantic and spiritual love. It's so crazy to think that an increased quotient of joy in people's lives might lead them to treasure life more dearly and protect it more carefully, both their lives and the lives of other people. So I know to some of you, and maybe to most of you, that this all sounds like a crazy, unattainable, hippie dream. But 50 years ago, 
Almost everybody said that legalizing cannabis was a crazy, unattainable, hippie dream. And today, today it is legal. It is legal in many places. It is becoming legal in many more places tomorrow. And it eventually will be legal everywhere in the world. And in the years since, in the years since, us hippies have brought many a wonderful thing to mainstream society. Things like yoga and acupuncture personal computers, electric cars, even organic food, premarital sex. And when I look around, right, yeah, you have us to thank for it. <laughs> so, and I look around, right, I look around and I, I, get, I get so inspired these days looking around at new social movements, new social movements that are coming up, right? looking at things like Occupy Wall Street and Black Lives Matter and the New Green Deal. And I see the values that we hippies developed reflected and echoed in those new social movements. So I believe in the power of hippie dreams because I've seen so many of them come true. And there's never been a time that we needed them more. There's never been a time that the stakes are so high. Our world sits on the brink of self-destruction. Countries and ethnicities and tribes and sects engage in genocidal violence with increasing viciousness and impunity. Despots and dictators continue to point nuclear weapons at each other and threaten to blow each other up and, and all of us along with them. And our air and our food and our water is still being poisoned with industrial chemicals. Young people, young people are so full of despair, so manipulated by power brokers and ideology and digital poison that they compete with each other. From Florida to Pakistan to find ever more inventive ways to kill themselves and other people along with them. There's never been a time ever in human history that we so urgently needed to learn how to live with one another to resolve our inevitable disputes without violence, to put some real brakes on mutually assured destruction before it actually happens, to find some way to transform our manifold hatreds into one love. Cannabis might not be the whole answer, but it is surely, it is certainly a part of the answer. And the only thing, the only thing that stops us, that prevents us from moving forward with the cannabis renaissance is ignorance. And as of now, as of this moment, everyone in this room, all of you, everybody with an earshot of my voice, you have been empowered to address and resolve that ignorance. And I hope that you will do that. I hope you will join me in building the kind of world we all really want to live in. Welcome to the cannabis renaissance. I, I so appreciate your attention. You know, most of my career, I spent being laughed at by people who thought I was too crazy to listen to. So I very much appreciate you coming here and lending me your minds and lending you your ears. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yes, we do. OK, all right. Slido is going to come up here on the screen. It's going to give me a choice of questions, and I'm going to choose one of them. That has not happened yet, however. Right now, all we have is a screen that has that South by Southwest arrow and saying, join us, slido.com. So how would I recommend getting into hemp production? Well, the first thing to do is, is understand how your state is going to handle hemp. That's something that's in the process of being worked out. The USDA has been holding listening sessions with people in the hemp industry to get some kind of understanding of what those regulations uh, should look like. State of California is going through the same process right now. There are other states like Kentucky that have already pretty much had that worked out. So if you 
really want to get into the hemp industry quickly, look for one of the states like Kentucky that's already producing hemp. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, so anandamide, a uh, question here about anandamide, uh, which is one of the endocannabinoids, and I believe it's the endocannabinoid that's closest in molecular structure to THC, am I correct in that? Okay, we're not certain, we're, we are not certain about that. Um, uh, but uh, anandamide is one of many, many different endocannabinoids uh, that, are, that are in the human body. And you know, the, I think the point is that these things are really critically important for human health. And, um, and they've been removed from our healthcare system. They've been removed from our nutritional system. There's many people who believe that, um, that if we switch to uh, more hemp-based foods, especially for animals, that we see a lot of more comic, uh, common medical complaints be addressed through that. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Uh, kind of in the back. Okay. How about the banking system? What are some of the troubles that you're having with dealing with the banking system? Troubles with the banking system. Oh, where would you like me to start? <laughs> um, so for those of you who don't know, um, uh, it's basically impossible for cannabis businesses to get normal banking services in this country due to the position of the federal government. Um, it causes a lot of problems. I mean, um, imagine that you have to pay all of your bills in cash. So uh, I had people who were going to the Oakland treasurer's office once every two weeks to pay our taxes and we're carrying hundreds of thousands of dollars in regular civilian cars over to this place. Why? Because they wouldn't give me armored car service either. Right? Uh, so that's one of the, the, the problems, is just managing that volume of cash. Another problem is that you can't get credit cards right? uh, and sometimes can't even get debit card service. So everybody who comes into a cannabis dispensary has to get cash before they come to the dispensary or pull cash out of an ATM. Uh, pretty inconvenient. Another one of the things that's happening now when you have more scaled up cannabis companies who are doing business as a larger volume is there's, there are transactions which are so large that you really can't do them by cash, like property purchases. And sometimes it's been very, very difficult to make those transactions happen because you can't get a bank account. Um, consumer education is falling in the hands of underqualified, underpaid bud tenders. Um, what do you have for like a list of five references for bud tenders seeking education? Well, let me stick up for some bud tenders anyhow and say that, that there, you know, there, are, there are dispensaries such as the Harborside dispensaries where you'll get pretty top-notch cannabis information. But it's spotty and you don't know. And there's a vast need for training in the cannabis industry in, in all different parts of the supply chain. Uh, my favorite source for cannabis training and information is Green Flower Media at greenflowermedia.com. Um, yeah, they do a great job. Full disclosure, I've also got a show on that platform, Ask Steve. Um, so I'm a little bit biased. Uh, but I, I know that there are, there are a number of companies that are coming out with a variety of different ways of, of closing that gap. Some are, are looking at providing information directly to consumers via video displays, tables, various different kinds of things in the dispensaries uh, themselves. Other um, uh, companies are developing various different types of training programs uh, for, for bud tenders and, and for other people in the industry. It's, it's all just a mark of, of what's happening with cannabis now, that it's, that it's being professionalized, that, that we are able to, to do things like you know, have training and hire employees and build careers. Uh, so, you know, it's, a, it's another part of this exciting phase that we're in with cannabis. Hi, thank you for speaking. Um, I have a question. Like you said, you know, with, with federal about to possibly happen and be possible and more states are 
uh, gravitating towards the model of not just California, but Canada, there's such a still a high rise with cannabis and marijuana convictions and people that do want to get into the industry, but they've already been arrested for, you know, being in the illicit market, but still being, you know, that pot dealer, you know, or that supplier. Can you kind of like tell me what that could or possibly would look like? Because I know that California, they're doing like automatic expungements now on cannabis and marijuana convictions. Do you see that happening across the whole U.S.? Like, what does that look like to you? So the, um, the question is, is, is about expungement and how people who have been arrested on, and convicted on cannabis charges could get into the industry. And it's, it's a subject that's close to my heart because I've been denied cannabis licenses that I otherwise would have received because of my cannabis convictions. Um, the, the city of San Francisco recently automatically expunged all cannabis convictions in, in the city. And, uh, and that measure should be a standard part of every single cannabis legislation. The state of California should absolutely do that at the earliest opportunity on the state level. Let's think about this, right? We as a society have decided that we were wrong. It shouldn't be a crime. It's going to be legal, right? Well, if that's true, then we shouldn't keep punishing people who were convicted of something that we've decided is no longer criminal behavior. But we are, right? You can be denied licenses, you can be denied leases, you can be denied jobs, you can be denied passports, you can be denied mortgages, you can be denied access to retirement accounts because you have a cannabis conviction. So. Um, I will, I will let you know that, that I have begun working on a project, and I know that there are other projects that are underway to not just expunge people's records. We need to go a step beyond that because there are people, thousands of people, who are locked up in cages and may remain locked up in cages for the rest of their lives if we don't do something to make sure that people who are convicted of a crime that's no longer a crime and we're put into prison for that, we need to get them out, every single last one of them. Our job as a movement isn't done until our last prisoner comes home, wherever they are. It doesn't matter where in the world. None of us are free until all of us are free. Yeah, all important stuff, right? We, we didn't start this movement to make people who are already wealthy wealthier. We started this movement to change the world. And in the view of myself and many other people, that means that we need to build an industry that's not just a new industry that looks like any other industry. It needs to be a new kind of industry. It needs to break the mold of standard uh, corporate structure, and it needs to, to work to unleash this change that we so desperately need in the world. So if, if you have time after this, you might want to head down to Starbucks and put a little bit of muscle into that. Yeah. Okay, I'm getting the wrap it up signal. Does that mean not one more or one more? We got to wrap it up. Thank you all so much for coming and listening to me. I do appreciate it very much. Thank you.